my name is Dr. Judd Mal. I'm the director of the Duke Prostate Center and uh, chief of urology at Duke University Medical Center in Durham, North Carolina. How do you talk to newly diagnosed patients about all the new options for first-line treatment today? I'm a little bit blessed at my institution in that we're, we have a true multidisciplinary clinic where we have an opportunity for patients who are newly diagnosed but those men who sometimes are confused about which direction to go in they can go to this special clinic where they can see a urologist, a medical oncologist, and a radiation oncologist in the same setting. Now, in the real world, many patients don't have the luxury of a multidisciplinary clinic, so they're likely to see the urologist as a first-line person who will counsel them, and typically, since the urologist is doing the prostate biopsy, the urologist is going to be the first-line person to do the initial counseling. I think a patient needs to recognize that they need to find a doctor who is not arrogant because a good doctor should talk to the patient about the uncertainties. The fact that if we're really honest with patients, we really don't know what the best treatment is and the best treatment is going to be very individualized based on the wants, needs and desires of that particular patient. Um, obviously, the patient also has to recognize that even though doctors are professionals and doctors, I think, in the vast majority of cases, have the, the patient's best interest in mind, patients have to recognize there are ulterior motives, there are other pressures that are driving physicians sometimes to make treatment decisions. For example, many urologists will favor radical prostatectomy because they're surgeons at heart and they tend to believe, many of them, that surgery is the best treatment. By the same token, radiation oncologists obviously are trained as radiation oncologists and they generally have a natural bias to believe that what they do works. Um, in this country, physicians get reimbursed based on doing things to patients. And so many healthcare systems or many doctors may not be that motivated to recommend active surveillance because they might not receive the reimbursement that they would if the patient was receiving surgery or radiation. On the other hand, uh, in the long term, those patients on active surveillance are going to have a long-term relationship to the physician, so it may work out in the end. You have protocols at Duke for some of the newer investigational therapies, such as HIFU and vocal therapy. Where do you see those studies going? I think for the average patient, even though I'm at an institution where we do clinical trials, for the average patient that we see, the majority of them will receive either a radical prostatectomy or some type of radiotherapy or active surveillance. In fact, if we look at the first 700 patients that we've recently studied that have gone through our true multidisciplinary clinic over the last several years, about 50% of those men who were fully counseled by all three specialists uh, had surgery. About 30% had radio, some form of radiotherapy. About 10% had uh, active surveillance or started on active surveillance. And about 10% of those patients went on clinical trials. So even at a research institu institution where we offer focal cryotherapy on a clinical trial basis or offer HIFU, high intensity focused ultrasound on a clinical trial, about 10% of our patients who are fully counseled will end up going on one of those trials. Now in the real world, HIFU is also being offered outside the United States uh, as a fee-for-service basis, uh, somewhat like medical tourism where the physician can take the patient outside the boundaries of the United States and do that treatment. That may be that may end up being a very good treatment for prostate cancer. We simply do not know but patients also need to recognize that many of those physicians also have some ulterior motives or there may be some financial incentives that is, uh, you know, suggesting that those patients take that treatment. And I think it's important for patients to understand that. Again, not that it's right or wrong, just as a fact that patients need to be aware of some of those relationships and be bold enough to talk to their doctors about that. The other thing that patients need to be very careful about is if a doctor gets mad at the patient if they request a second opinion, that would be a red flag and I would tell a family member if a doctor does that, gets mad at you for asking for a second opinion, get another doctor. Uh, that, that suggests that they truly are trying to maybe steer that patient in a direction and they may have other motives that may not always be in the patient's best interest. 
Um, as far as cryotherapy uh, being the freezing technique for prostate, the standard cryotherapy is going to be total gland cryotherapy where the entire gland is treated. And that's been the standard, that's FDA approved, that's endorsed by the American Urologic Association. The downside of that whole gland therapy is the probably the highest risk of erectile dysfunction because that freezing technique that treats the whole gland also may freeze the neurovascular bundles and cause the most problems with sexual dysfunction. Institutions such as Duke are looking at this focal cryotherapy where they treat only a portion of the gland and that may preserve sexual function but it's a clinical trial right now because we really don't know if that's going to treat the cancer long term as well as some of the other therapies. At this annual meeting of the American Urological Association, have you heard about anything on the horizon that looks particularly promising? As a guy who kind of eats, sleeps, and drinks prostate, that's what my wife says anyway, I would say that this is a fun meeting because uh, for everything that we learn new, there's about two or three additional debates. And I think that's a key message for patients that even though we, many of us believe and are passionate about some of the standard therapies. For example, personally, I'm a surgeon, and I believe in my heart that for many patients, surgery still offers the best hope for a very long-term cure. Um, I think that those of us in the field who really have our patients' best interest in mind really need to admit to the patients that there are many uncertainties and try to do our best job possible to explain the uh, controversies to the patients in language that they can understand.